Over the long term, it's hard for a stock to earn a much better return than the business which underlies it earns. If the business earns 6% on capital, this is the return on capital again, over 40 years, I have no idea why you chose 6% in 40 years, but it doesn't matter. You hold it for that 40 years, you're not going to make much different than a 6% return. Here's the punchline, even if you originally buy it at a huge discount. Right? Conversely, if a business earns 18% on capital over 20 or 30 years, even if you pay an expensive looking price, there's the punchline the other way, you'll end up with one hell of a result. Right? Now, Mr. Munger is not speculating on this. He's not offering you his, uh, a suggestion. It's mathematically a fact. Right? Here's two companies, and your investing career, 40 years, seems like a long time, but actually most of us, given our lifespan now, are going to be investors for much longer than 40 years. Actually, even if we start in our 30s, say, we're going to be investors for much longer than that. Um, and these two companies, are you've got a very simple choice. You've just got to own company A or company B for the 40 years. That's all it is. That's all you're required. Company A has a return on capital employed of 20%, and B has one of 10%. To make this simple, in terms of mental arithmetic, so you don't have to do complex mental arithmetic, neither company pays a dividend. So 100% of their post-tax returns are invested in their business, and they both have the same tax rate. So I hope, having... Uh, board for Britain on return on capital employed for the last 20 minutes or so, I could convince you that A might be the better investment to select. However, if only life were that simple, on the day when you go to buy them, they are differently rated. A is trading on four times book value on the stock market, B is only two times book value. For those of you who are not analysts, book value is the capital, take it as the capital employed there. So for every pound of capital employed in this lovely 20% earning company, you've got to pay four in share price terms. Whereas unsurprisingly, with this one that only makes 10%, you've only got to pay two. A bit trickier, isn't it? Which one do you want now? It gets worse. When you come to sell them 40 years later, because you want to invest in bonds and lose money, um, this one has halved in valuation. I've no idea why it's occurred. Um, it's out of fashion. Uh, your timing is bad. For whatever reason, it, just take my word for it, it's happened. It's gone from four pounds for every pound of book value to two pounds. This one, on the conversely, is in fashion at the moment. It's doubled its valuation. Now, which one do you want to own? Hmm? It's still A. Now, believe it or not, I and mean, we can send you the spreadsheet for anybody who wants this if you ask us afterwards, you've actually got enough information here, not for the gobbledygook that I talk about, return on capital employed, price of the book. You, you've got all the data there where if we tell you the share price at the outset, we can tell you what you would have gained at the end and what the compound return would be. You've got everything you need there in those few numbers. Your terrible timing here, but in this very good company, would have cut your share price compound annual growth rate to 18%. You'd have taken 2% off from what Charlie Munger tells you is the underlying return. This one, your brilliance, or luck, I don't know which it is, would have got the return up to a whole 12%. Over the long term, it's the return that the company makes on the capital it reinvests, which will determine your outcome, not whether you buy it cheap and sell it expensive or the other way around. Um, here's a real company to illustrate that. This is a company that you've heard of, I would imagine. I would be fairly confident you've used its products. Um, it's a consumer products company. These are three years' actual numbers. Don't bother looking at them all. I'll just pick out a few. Here's three years. You can see its sales went from $15 billion to $17, nearly $18 to $19 billion. And its uh, net profit, which is somewhere here, net income, uh, where are we? Uh, did a net income went from $900 million to $1.1 billion. It's growing at about 8% per annum. Uh, these are not atypical years. I haven't put 20 years up there only because it would be a crowded slide. They're very typical of how this company performs to this day. It continues to perform a bit like this. Um, and it did before. Um, what would you be prepared to pay for this company? So now we get back to the cheap you know, uh, or expensive. So never mind per share, we'll just do it for the whole company. So if it makes $1.1 billion in net income, would you pay a PE, a price earnings ratio of 10? So you buy, could I get you all to bound together with me tonight and we'll go and buy this company for $11 billion? Now I reckon you would. I, don't, you, you, I might be able to get you in for that one, yeah? How about getting you to pay 20 times earnings so we pay $22 billion? Hmm, I think now we'd start hearing people go, well, it's a bit expensive, isn't it? Yeah? Hmm. How about 30 times? 32. Not one of you would come with me. Mark might, because he knows the example. The rest of you, I've got no confidence at all that I can get you to come along. Uh, 40 times, you would be trying to get, find, a few, find a short seller uh, for the company, basically, at that point in the proceedings. Right? Now, this is a company called PepsiCo. Hmm? And I didn't actually lie to you on the previous slide, because I'm not like that, but I did do something slightly misleading. You see, the years that I put up, I labeled 2014, 15, and 16. 
Uh, and actually, they're not. They are actually 1989, 1991. Um, so they're 25 years ago. So I did it to you because we can now tell what happened with our decision that I was trying to get you to make with me. So let's look what happened fundamentally. Uh, the $19 billion of sales became $62 billion in the intervening years because we've got the 2016 results here. We can tell you what happened. Yeah? Um, the $1.1 billion of, um, of profits became $6.6 .6 billion of profit, so it went up six times. The market value went from $27 billion to $146 billion. You'll get told, by the way, in relation to our strategy, that these companies are more expensive than they've ever been. I'll come back to that perhaps a bit later. No, they're not. Actually, this company is much more lowly rated now than it was back then. So 22 times earnings versus 25. Okay, how did we get on? Well, if we bought the company for 10 times, we'd have made 14.3% per annum return, because we can tell you what happened to the share price now over the 25 years. If I got you to pay 20 times, we'd have made 11.1%. If I got you to pay 30 times, remember none of you, I didn't hear any protests. Yeah, I'd be in Terry, I didn't hear any of that. We'd be on 9.3%, okay? 40, uh, uh, 40 times 8.1%. The S&P 500 for the same period with dividends reinvested was 9.1% per annum. This is the toughest index in the world for fund managers to even equal, let alone beat. We could have paid 32 times earnings with PepsiCo and equaled an index that most fund managers find impossible to beat. Human beings are really bad at working out the effect of differential compound growth rates over long periods of time. We don't realize quite what happens when companies compound their earnings in the way that these companies compound. We're very, very bad at judging the outcome. We could have paid 32 times earnings for PepsiCo back there at 1991 and, and equaled the index. We could have paid 30 times and beaten the index. Uh, basically. Now, I know a valid question is, yeah, but is this the same as 1991? I haven't got a clue. Um, but I do know this. Every time you make an investment decision now, you're making a judgment and a bet about the future. And I think this is a lot more predictable than your airline stock or your oil and gas stock or your bank uh, and so on. That's a real life example. Here's another real life example. Uh, this is the S&P 500. And this is about market timing and valuation. Yeah. Let's imagine you were very, very clever, lived a very long time, and started very early. And what you did was you bought the S&P 500 at its low in the, in the 20th century and sold it at its high in valuation terms. You would have been buying it in 1917. The lowest valuation S&P was the day America entered World War I, uh, when the price earnings ratio was 5.3. And you'd have sold it just at the peak of the dot-com boom in 1999 when it's 34 times. Ignore the charts, just, just look at the, the numbers perhaps for a moment. Um, you would have made a compound annual return of 11.6% per annum by buying at its low in valuation, selling at its high in valuation. Well done, that's a pretty good return, not bad. But we can break down what comes from your cleverness with the timing and the valuation and what comes from the companies just reinvesting by the following method. If you put into a calculator, if you've got a Hewlett Packard 12C like me, the old industry standard, you can work out what you made from this because you can put in minus 5.3 present value, 34 future value, uh, the number of years in here, which is 82 years, I believe, 82, yeah. Um, and press the button, it will tell you that 2.3% of that 11.6 came from your cleverness. 80% of the return came from the companies just reinvesting and compounding in value. Yeah. Uh, this is 500 average companies. This is not a particularly good company with a 29% return. 80% of the return, it's a, an example of Pareto's law. 80% of the result comes from 20% of, of the actions. 80% of this came from the companies investing in, and not you doing anything. Um, if you do it with a good company, this is our friend Unilever again for 20 years, and you do the same calculation. If you bought it in 95 on 16.8 times, sold it in 2016 on 21 times, well done. Obviously, you made a 10.9% return over that period. If you do the same calculation, you'd find 1.1% of this came from the uplift in value. 90% of it comes from the company. Over the long term, it's what the company does that makes money, not what you do. We still, having said all that, so I've said Charlie Munger says it's what the company does, not, not your, uh, your, your valuation that gets you there. I've given you the theoretical company A and B, I've given you the PepsiCo example, and I've talked about comparing what happened with the index and Unilever. Having said all that, we do try not to overpay, because I mean, you would be mad to go out there and deliberately overpay. So we do, every day, in real time, compare a thing called the free cash flow yield. So the free cash flows that our companies generate after paying for everything except the dividend. So we divide that by their market value to get a yield number. That's our cash flow. It belongs to us, the shareholders. And we compare that free cash flow now and in about four or five years' time. And we can see, is it growing? Remember, we like growth with each other 
our investable universe of stocks that we follow that we would be prepared to own with the market, with bonds, and with any other yardstick. And we try every day to make sure that we're invested in the companies which are good companies that we would own, which give the best combination of value. So having said that it's not that important, we don't ignore it. 